Court of Appeals Division One is now in session. Thank you. You may be seated. We are here this morning on our case number 1CACV150135FC, uh, Nicholas versus Nicholas. Uh, counsel, as you both know, each side is allowed 20 minutes to make your argument. Uh, the appellate may reserve any amount of time you'd like to use in rebuttal. If you do, you're in charge of keeping track of your own time. The clock on the podium will reflect the total amount of time you have remaining, including what you've decided to reserve, even if you tell us ahead of time. Um, we record these proceedings, so please, when you approach the podium and for the appellant each time, uh, recite your name and the name of your client so that when we go back and watch or listen to the recording, we'll know who's who. We have read the briefs. We have studied the record, <coughs> and uh, we've also discussed the case in our conference this morning. So with that, you may proceed. May it please the court. My name is Stanley David Murray, and I'm the attorney for the appellant, Philip H. Nicholas, who was the respondent in the lower court proceedings. And yes, I'd like to reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal. The first issue that we raise in our opening brief regards jurisdiction. Subject matter jurisdiction is kind of a tough issue to present, especially since it wasn't raised in the lower court before. But our reading of ARS 25-411A requires a one-year moratorium, if you will, before you can file a petition to modify child custody, now known as legal decision-making authority. But is that really jurisdictional, or is that simply uh, uh, prescribing a procedure that the family court ought to follow? Well, the procedure part of it, Your Honor, is the drafting of the pleadings, whether you have to have an affidavit with detailed facts and you have to set forth a change of circumstances, but a timing issue, we feel, is different from the procedural issues raised in the uh, Dorman case. In fact, a Dorman case cites to a Kentucky case, the Petrie versus Cain case, I believe it is, in footnote uh, two at the end of the decision. And that case did involve a two-year time limitation or a party was trying to modify before that two-year period had expired. That court said it is jurisdictional because you've got to comply with the requirements if you're going to ask for modification before two years have expired. I think there are no circumstances under which it would be appropriate for the court to uh, to revisit a ruling? In the statute, Your Honor, you have to show that there is some kind of endangerment to the child's emotional, mental, or physical health. But nothing short of endangerment. Exactly. And so you can't make that modification request unless that one year period has expired or you allege sufficient facts to show exigent circumstances. And I cite to the Georgia case also, which is an Arizona case, which to talks there, about to, to, to make to decide whether there um, these exigent circumstances doesn't the court have jurisdiction to reach that determination? Jurisdiction seems like a different question than whether you've you've shown something. Well, the jurisdiction issue turns on those facts. Have they alleged that there was an endangerment to the child to meet that one-year requirement? and it wasn't alleged in this case, and yes, the court could have made those findings if it was in the petition, but the petition did not allege it, so the one-year limitation period applies, in our opinion. The, 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 the one-year limitation was not in the statute that was uh, at the time that the Dorman case took up the statute. It was added later. But the Dorman case did, didn't it? Isn't it true, though, that the Dorman case discussed uh, exactly the issue you're raising, which is do the requirements of 411, are those jurisdictional or are those merely uh, the standards that the Israel. court needs to? So, and so why should it be that the one-year limitation in the statute that was added to the statute after the Dorman case issued its ruling, why should we elevate that to a jurisdictional requirement when uh, Dorman didn't do that to the other uh, other requirements in the statute. Right. Dorman didn't deal with that one-year limitation period, so call this a case of first impression then. And based on the Georgia case and based on the Kentucky case, which I think is very persuasive, 
you can't proceed with a modification request if that one-year period hasn't expired yet. That seems to me like an enabling statute, if you will, that you can't do something unless you meet this jurisdictional requirement. Mm -hmm. The courts in family law especially, we don't have any authority except what's provided by statute. That statute says you can't hear this modification in less than a year unless there's exigent circumstances. What about, so Dorman didn't address that. Right. But what about in this case, as is so often the situation in family <laughs> court, by the time the court held the hearing and ruled, a lot longer than one year had passed. Yes, that was the argument that uh, Mr. Shields made, that it was a sort of a waiver. But jurisdictional issues can't be waived, and we've cited authority for that position. Mm -hmm. that they can be raised at any time. If the judgment's void, it's void. And once it's been presented to this court, the court had an obligation to consider that. But given given the subject matter of family court and the fact that, that, it, that the best interests of children are always uh, they always are of most Im importance. I mean, doesn't that argue that, in, in, doesn't that, it, that tend to support the proposition that the one-year limitation, the arbitrary one-year limitation, was not intended to be jurisdictional? Well, I believe it is because not only the best interest tests or the best interest concerns are important and paramount to the court, but you don't get to the best interests unless you can show one, it's change of circumstances. That's not a jurisdictional issue necessarily. That's procedural because it's a fact issue. But then you also have the <laughs> requirement of that one-year limitation under 411A, which says, no, we don't get to the modification issue. We don't get to the best interest unless you meet this one-year requirement. So that's the our ruling position. was issued, though, more than one year after. Oh. Sorry? The, the ruling was more than a year subsequent. And, and if there's been no, if, if no one has raised the issue to the court, and it's been more than a year, why, why would we just send something back to, to reach the same conclusion? Well, the one-year period doesn't depend on the ruling of the court. It depends on when the petition is filed. And it's not disputed on this record that the decree was entered in June 26 of 2013, and the petition was filed April 24th of 2014. So it hasn't been a one-year period there. And yes, the court can proceed if nobody raises it. But again, back to that jurisdictional issue, which can be raised at any time, and I cite Glover versus Glover as an example of that, the court should not have proceeded, didn't have subject matter jurisdiction to do so. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, so that would be our position on the jurisdictional issue. Um, the second issue that we raise is the change of circumstances that have to be alleged in that petition. And the motion to dismiss that uh, Mr. Clark, the attorney representing Mr. Nicholas at the trial, file the motion to dismiss to challenge those allegations. So the only that argument, as I understand it, is that uh, under the same statute, I mean, even if even if it's not jurisdictional, it certainly is the case that uh, the, the court should not set a hearing on a motion uh, to change um, custody time. Whatever. <laughs> uh, oh, ab unless the petition adequately offers evidence of of a change in circumstances. Right, under 25411L, I believe it is. Right. You have to have detailed facts set out in an affidavit or a verified petition. We challenged that. They argued that we waived it, but we challenged that with that motion to dismiss because remember, yeah. the trial court was still trying to decide if it had jurisdiction. They had to consult with the California court. And when they did that, then it became ripe for the motion to dismiss since Arizona was going to keep the case. And so the finding should have been that, no, this isn't sufficient, because all she alleged was that she was married. We already dealt with the fact that she was living in California with her boyfriend, because she's married, it's not a change of circumstances affecting the kids. And we also dealt with the fact that the kids were in California. Judge LeClaire, the judge that issued the decree, really had no choice but to let the kids stay there, because my client was in Tennessee at the time. Nobody's in Virginia anymore. And he's going to retire in Arizona then might as well just let the kids stay in California and then come to Arizona as the judge ordered. Mother didn't comply with that order either. Now one of the arguments made is that this is a parenting time issue and so it shouldn't really matter that we have to make all these findings or that we have to make those allegations. But the cases that we cite, Owen versus Blackhawk in particular, deal with a change of physical custody. And a change of physical custody is now under the rubric, if you will, of parenting time, and we cite the memorandum decision in the Santillan case that talks about how that term has been redefined. Physical custody now is part of parenting time. 
So <clears throat> the court was required to make that finding of a substantial and continuing change of circumstances before it could proceed. Well, it was required to. Was it, now, is that the case, or was it required to, uh, or was uh, the petitioner required to offer evidence of a substantial and continuing change of circumstances? The petitioner was required to allege it and yeah. prove it. Yes, ma'am. But in order to have the hearing, though, I mean, isn't that, as I understand the brief, the brief doesn't argue that the court erred ultimately by finding that it was in the best interest of the children to remain in California with their mother. Correct. Um, instead, I, I, I read the brief as saying the court erred, I mean, past the jurisdictional argument and, and separate from the fees argument, the court erred by setting a hearing. Yes, ma'am. It didn't have the power to set the hearing because the petition didn't adequately allege a change in circumstances. circumstances. Right. Okay. And that is under the abuse of discretion standard, but there's no facts to support the court's finding <clears throat> that it had the power to proceed with the best interest test, if you will. Is there, any, is there any requirement in the statute or cases that the court make specific written findings regarding change of circumstance before proceeding with a hearing? No, or, sir. Or, or even after a hearing saying, uh, I'm proceeding because. No, the only requirement is under 25403, and the court did do that. Yes. But it didn't address the change of circumstances, and no, it's not required to make those findings unless we had made a Rule 82 request. I, I, think, I think Mother is arguing that the court, in essence, did, re, did address change of circumstances by virtue of some of the findings that were made. And that's the question for us to consider, is what supports the change of circumstances? The abuse of discretion is that there's no evidence to support a change of circumstances. Moving to Tucson is not a change of circumstances. All Father had to do was move to Arizona. Getting married to her boyfriend is not a change of circumstances to merit modification. Uh, I can't remember the other excuse that they came children, up with. The but children doing well, though, and... Uh... I have to admit, yes, sir. And how about, they're doing well. How about the children doing well and and, and bonded to to a half sibling? Uh, isn't there some value? In, isn't that a changed circumstance? No, because that was anticipated by Judge Leclaire. He knew the kids had to stay in California. They couldn't go with father in Tennessee, and they couldn't go to Arizona yet because nobody was in Arizona. And Mom made it clear she wasn't coming back to Arizona. She was going to stay in California. So the issue for Judge LeClaire is, what do I do with these kids? I can't send them in Arizona. I'm not going to send them in Tennessee. They're just going to move back to Arizona later. So I, and because Mother wrongfully relocated to California in the first place, I don't think her conduct can be condoned by saying, oh, she's caused a change of circumstances now. We should proceed. How long does that tarnish stay with her? Well, it stays with her for this particular hearing because she's asking for the modification request. She's got to prove a change of circumstances different from those considered by Judge LeClaire. But, but what, you're, what you're asking us to do, and I, I think I understand the argument, and, and, uh, but what you're asking us to do is to undo a hearing where the judge made pretty thorough 23-page findings on, on the 403 factors mm -hmm. and found best interest, which, which you're acknowledging, uh, or at least not contesting, Right. And and, uh, uh, and and to, to undo all of that because the, the judge in, in, in his discretion should not have held a hearing as you see it. Let me clarify my position then. Yeah. Judge LeClaire made those same 25403 findings. Now we're making new 25403 hearings, almost like this is a horizontal appeal because we have no basis to modify in the first place. So I'm saying this court should disregard the findings that Judge Edelman made because Judge LeClaire made 25403 findings that weren't appealed. And yes, the court has continuing jurisdiction to modify custody, but there's got to be a basis to modify custody before Judge Edelman can make those 25403 pleadings or findings. Uh, so if the basis, pleadings aren't sufficient. A basis of changed circumstances, as we say. I keep coming back to changed circumstances, yeah. Your Honor. If they're not shown, I'm sorry Judge Edelman made all those findings but he shouldn't have gone that far. He should have granted the motion to dismiss. Hmm. And let's remember also that the mother relocated to Arizona, uh, from Arizona to California without father's consent. They did have an agreement that she could relocate to Arizona with the kids, and then she moves after she tries to dismiss her case, not only in violation of their agreement, 
but also in violation of preliminary injunction. Then, July 1st of 2014, when she's supposed to return the children, she doesn't do that either. Why is the court condoning what mother did by acting in the best interest of the child, allegedly, when mother has caused all these circumstances to exist to the detriment of the father who wants to have a relationship with his kids? So we sincerely hope that the court will take a look at that position from my client complying with everything that the court ordered versus mother not complying with anything and yet still prevailing in this case on the custody it's issue. It's certainly a very sympathetic position, but assume the, the circumstances are a little bit different, that mother um, seeks permission from the court to go over to care for a, uh, an ill relative and is over there for a period of time and the kids adjust and it looks like a better, or it looks like a good place for the kids without any kind of background backdrop of there's been a violation of an order or uh, hasn't received permission to do something. Mm -hmm. would, the, would the court be entitled to make a finding that it's in the kid's best interest to conduct a hearing and say it's in the, best, the children's best interest to stay in California? If the change of circumstances was shown. But the, the change in circumstances were have, have already happened. She went over to, to care for uh, an ailing relative. Uh, maybe she thought it would, the circumstances would end, but and I suppose you could say the circumstances are now that they need to stay there longer. She, she's still needed over there. Okay, so she's brought the children over there while well, she's taking care of the mother. Right. So she hasn't violated any court orders in the meantime. Right. That would be a different situation than ours. But why is, it, why is it different? Because mother violated court orders in going to California in the first place here. But, but once, she, once she's there, there wasn't really a, a request to, to send her back to Arizona. That was... That wasn't really, it was kind of neither here nor there because father was in, in another state and so there wasn't really a request to come back. So I'm just having a hard time seeing that it's that much different than assuming she had permission to get over there. And well, that would, be a, there. that would be a change of circumstances for the kids then because apparently when they left Arizona, they had better educational in California or whatever it was. They adjusted better to the California lifestyle. But remember, Judge LeClaire considered that when he made his order. So... That would be how I distinguish your fact situation, if that answers your question. I was going to talk about the attorney's fees issue real quick, but I think I'll save my time for rebuttal unless the court has any other questions. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Mark Shields. I represent the appellee Dion Nicholas, now known as Dion Voltz, V-O-L-T-Z. I have to start by making a correction to uh, an implicit understanding that I had in the response brief. Uh, Mr. Murray had stated in his opening brief that the order, the original parenting order, was entered less than a year before the petition was filed. I need to be specific on this and, and uh, ask for the court's forgiveness. The decree was entered less than a year, but the parenting order was not entered less than a year before the petition. The parenting order was entered on April 18th of 2013. And this is that complete order that the, I, I think uh, multiple judges noted was so full of findings, very, very well thought out. That's the order that counts because that's the order that's followed, that's the order that establishes the status quo for the children. The decree itself was entered on June 28th, but the petition to modify was filed on April 28th, 2014. Now that's more than a year after the signed parenting order. That obviates the whole jurisdictional argument. I will still address it um, because we're here and we should be thorough, but really that takes the legs out from the whole jurisdictional argument. I want to, before I get to the uh, jurisdiction and the specific points of the law, what I really want to stress is the simple best interest standard. The evidence in this record includes uh, perhaps preeminently a parenting conference report. That parenting conference report says that it would be detrimental to relocate the children to Arizona. All evidence is, as, as I think was pointed out in your hypothetical, Judge Katani, the children are thriving. The children are doing very well in California. There have been uh, multiple points of interest in there that show that the children are doing well. Now, why do I bring this out ahead of the legal arguments that I'm so anxious to get to? Because this is a parenting case. This is about children, much more than it is about parents. Perhaps it's an odd name to call it parenting time, 
because it really truly is about children. A trial court's paramount concern is the children. This court's concern and the Supreme Court's concern is, again, primarily about the children. Is this a case where the children were not thriving in Arizona before going to California? Is, is the fi is, was the finding that they're that they're doing better now in California or just simply that they're they're thriving? I don't know that there is a, a any finding in the record as to how they were doing in Arizona versus how they uh, have been doing in California, but there clearly is a finding that moving them from California, or excuse me, there clearly is evidence that moving them from California back to Arizona would be detrimental. Now the law, in all that we consider on every level of court in Arizona is based around this consideration. Based around these facts, it is not vice versa. Please keep that in mind as we address these other but are arguments. You, are you saying, in essence, that the best interests of the children outweigh the need for changed circumstances? The best interests of the children certainly uh, include a changed circumstance, and I, I will get there. I think it will become quite clear. Uh, I want to start, though, with this subject matter jurisdiction, again, because it's their primary argument. The word jurisdiction appears dozens of times in Title 25. I was shocked to see how many times it does appear. But it doesn't appear anywhere in 25411. Uh, the legislature obviously knows how to use the term jurisdiction when it means jurisdiction, yet it chose not to do so in 25411. 25317G, uh, I think, paints a good picture of, of what a legislature is really thinking. In 25317G, the legislature said uh, certain situations, quote, prevent the court from exercising jurisdiction. Now, that's a jurisdictional statement. That particular um, statement has been interpreted to apply to subject matter jurisdiction. We don't see any such statement in 25411. That Dorman case really begins and ends this inquiry. Mr. Murray says, well, they're talking about a specific subsection of 25411 that, that doesn't apply, or as you pointed out, Judge Johnson didn't exist in the statute at the time. I'd like the court, however, to look more closely at those specific words in the Dorman ruling. It held that the requirements, that's plural, not just one subsection of 25411, but requirements, plural. It's a blanket a blanket, excuse me. It's not specific to any one subsection. And those requirements are, in fact, jurisdictional. Mr. Murray argued the Georgia case to the contrary. The Georgia case doesn't mention jurisdiction. It doesn't involve jurisdiction. If it did, we would have seen that loudly and clearly. The Lowther v. Hooker case on which Dorman is based strengthens this conclusion as well. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Beyond the jurisdictional question, uh, what evidence is there of change of circumstances different from the, the previous order? The kids were already in California, presumably doing well. Uh, so what's, what's the basis for, uh, for holding a hearing? The basis for holding a hearing, <laughs> as I pointed out in the brief, could have been anything, but it wasn't appealed. That brings us to a very good point, Your Honor, on uh, the Pridgen case, that's the keynote case for changes of circumstance. And that case notes, first of all, that a trial court has very, very wide, or excuse me, very wide discretion, don't want to fall into that trap, um, in determining what constitutes a change of circumstance. The facts of that case are particularly interesting because they provide a very good illustration of how wide that is. In Pridgen, one parent was granted custody, quote, unquote, uh, of the minor child in the decree, but the child had actually been living with the other parent for a significant period of time. I think it was even close to two years. And then that parent decided he wanted to formalize that. He filed a petition. Mom then insisted on the child coming back, and the court held child living with another parent for two years does not constitute a change of circumstance. Now, that to me is a huge change of circumstance. But it went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court have, uh, affirmed that this discretion is so wide, it can even include a child living with another parent for a significant period of time, and that doesn't constitute a change of circumstance. So what can constitute a proper change of circumstance? that is solely left to the trial court's broad discretion. It could be an adjustment. Um, it could be anything under 25403. There are numerous um, considerations. What are you saying the changes were here? 
The, well, the biggest change uh, has to be looked at at the time of the hearing. If we're not talking about challenging the initial petition, the time to challenge that has passed. I think no. I think that's the argument on appeal. It, it is the argument, and frankly, it misses the point because we're appealing an order. We're appealing a final order. Well, they're the not. They're they're making it's their appeal, and the argument that they are making, they're they're not they're not making a best interest argument. Correct. Their only argument, as I understand it. Is that the court abused its 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 uh, discretion by concluding that the petition set forth adequate facts to constitute a substantial and continuing change in circumstance? Uh, so and the the real issue before this court is the ultimate order that was entered, and the change the biggest change of circumstance by far the most obvious change of circumstance that I think any jurist would recognize is the fact that father chose to move to Tucson. Now, the order that <clears throat> contemplated his return to, quote, Arizona, I will point the court to page 6 of that uh, original order from Judge LeClaire. It states, quote, in close proximity, okay? It contemplated an equal parenting time order. Mr. Murray argues, well, it just says Arizona. Well, we know more than that, okay? We, we have to understand that Arizona that if, if one parent lives in Nogales and the other parent lives in Page, well, they're both still within Arizona, but it's the seventh biggest state geographically in America. You can't do an equal parenting time order with parents that far apart. In this case, even though father owned a home in Surprise, he chose to move clear down to Tucson. That makes, uh, a, excuse me, that makes a joint parenting order impracticable. And that is a required consideration under 25403. That is a massive <coughs> change of circumstance. It would be difficult to uh, contemplate a greater <coughs> change of circumstance. When the trial court has such wide latitude, the change of circumstance can include anything, such as the children uh, becoming more ingrained where they are. If the children don't want to return, the trial court is required to consider that. If the children are doing well, the very premise of 25411 is that if a circumstance uh, is not broken, don't fix it. Is the decision of the trial court to set a hearing on a 411 uh, petition uh, appealable? <clears throat> it would be certainly appealable um, through special action. You know, whether that is preserved all the way through here, I, I, I don't know that it would be, but I would again point the court to uh, multiple authorities that I've cited, including Dorman, that rest on the um, prejudice. Is this harmless error? Was there harmless error in a procedural ruling earlier? We don't know, but if the ultimate ruling is clearly in the children's best interests, as this is, any perceived error from, from an earlier ruling uh, that, that might or might not be subject to an appeal, frankly, is moot. And, and that's why I stress so much that the real issue here is <coughs> the ultimate ruling that was entered and the ultimate, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> undisputed change of circumstance. Just to be clear, so assume hypothetically that father had moved back to the same house that he owned. Um, what are the other change <coughs> circumstances? You're, you're saying that the children are, are doing well? Correct. But and it, that's an undisputed wouldn't there fact. have to be some indication that they would not do well if mother complied with the order and came back to, to Arizona? I don't know that there would have to be because the discretion is so wide, but there certainly is. And again, I point the court to the uh, parenting conference that uprooting the children would be detrimental to them. You know, we don't have to f have evidence of a, uh, a lack of best interests under this case, under this circumstance, but we still do have that. But that goes to best interests, right, not, not to change your circumstances. And, and again, I think the two are inextricably connected. Uh, any change of circumstance would be anything that would affect the children's best interests under the enumerated factors of 25403. And even then, we can't fit everything into 25403. We can't list everything that might or might not affect a child's best interests. But, uh, so, so they're inextricably these connected. Circumstances, it, really, it, it puts someone like father in a very difficult position if he's in, in another state. And uh, again, I understand there's a difference living in Tucson than living in Surprise. <clears throat> uh, but I assume that were not the case. And the original order contemplated, we understand that they're going to be living with mother wherever that is, uh, but they will be returned to Arizona when father retires and, and returns to Arizona. You could, you could make that argument, it seems like that order means nothing if the argument is simply, well, the children are, 
are doing well in California. That was that was contemplated, presumably, with the original order to say that they'll stay with mother until, uh, or that arrangement will stay in place until father returns to Arizona. And I think it's it's more than just what is complicated, or excuse me, contemplated that truly matters here, uh, because again, there would be evidence not just that oh they could do okay moving, but that it would be actually detrimental to them. And again, that that brings in something deeper than than hoping that the status quo or even contemplating that the status quo will continue to work well. This is actually. Uh, a case where what father is requesting would not work well. That brings me to a, to a point that I think is very important for this court to consider, though. Father, and there is a great deal of evidence about this on the record, certainly could have moved to the West Valley. He certainly had that within him. Instead, he chose a job that would pay him quite handsomely someplace else. Now, in a situation like that, his remedy is not to complain that the trial court abused its discretion or acted in ex excess of its jurisdiction, the remedy is simply to move. Now, Mr. Murray argues that well, there's no that evidence that he Mom, wouldn't move. Mom still is in California. Mom still is in California, but again, father chose, father's basing his whole argument on, hey, we were supposed to be able to I have complied. this 50-50. That's what he's saying. I complied. It, he complied by moving to Arizona, but it had to be within close proximity. That was understood, and I don't think that can be of the children, of where they were. And so, what, 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 what in the record, and it may be from the, from the prior proceedings, is there for the proposition that there was that the parties understood, that, they would live in the Phoenix area. Page six of the original order from April of 2013. And what is... It, specifically does it say? It says that it uses those words in close proximity. To what, Contemplating though? father's move to where that... Well, <laughs> mother was living in a home at Goodyear okay. with the children. Father and mother together owned a home in Surprise. That's the West Valley. Has it, has That's our touchstone. Has a mother, by moving to California, uh, rendered, rendered that little clause inoperable? No, because that happens frequently in relocation cases where a judge does, in fact, order a parent back if that parent wants to remain with the children. In this case, though, the court, uh, there would be nothing suggesting it would be in the best interest, and there are findings about this as well, to pick up the, the children and have them move to Tucson. In fact, there are even findings that fathers, there's no evidence about fathers' home in Tucson. There's no evidence that that could address the children's best interests. I think the, 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 the query here starts with a best, excuse me, with a status quo inquiry. The court's asking what the status quo was that gave rise to this ruling about proximity, and that's, what, that's where it started. Um, the parties, excuse me, mother and the children living in Goodyear, father and, father and mother owning a home uh, in Surprise. Father never lived in Arizona before, just to be clear on that. Um, but the, the status quo would have been established in, um, in the far west valley between Surprise and Goodyear. So from that, you, you say that you're that that the that the going forward assumption was that upon his retirement father would not only would that the order uh, was uh, premised on the notion that when father relocated to Arizona he would re relocate to the valley uh, and the fact that he didn't do that effectively is a change of circumstances over what people thought it, it is, clearly, and that's exactly what Judge Adelman found. Again, this notion that anywhere in Arizona counts does not make any sense because the order, the parenting time order that was to be uh, implemented upon this move clearly could not take place unless both parties were, again, in close proximity, to use that term. The point uh, of the order is so that the children can go to the same school, uh, whether they're staying with father or mother, that sort of thing? Is that it has to be logistically possible, yes. We don't want children to spend uh, four hours, is, which is what it would take at least if father were living in, in uh, Tucson each day to go back and forth, not each day, but several days a week. That's clearly not in any child's best interest. It's the only way to make a joint parenting plan work is to live closely. And again, those, that term logistically possible um, from Title 25. I want to address the fee issue very briefly. I think the court has everything it needs on the subject matter jurisdiction, although I'm tempted to talk about some other things because I do think there's some confusion in the statutes that uh, the legislature created in, in 2013 when it uh, changed the terms. 
But the fee issue, coming to this court today, Your Honor, there is no good faith basis for this jurisdictional argument, especially as we consider the fact that this parenting order was entered more than a year before the order. Obviates that the whole core of that argument. Best interest, as this court has pointed out, they've gone through this whole argument without even addressing best interest, which are the paramount concern in any family case. That leaves us, frankly, your honors, with an unreasonable position. Now, the record is clear on the other prong of the attorney fee statute, which is the comparative financial resources. We have a father here earning uh, close to $11,000 a month. We have a mother who is a stay-at-home mother and who earns only the, the diminished community portion of the military retirement that father is collecting. Father's remedy, frankly, was not within the walls of this court or within the walls of the trial court. Father's remedy simply was to move close to where the children were. That was his argument. That's what was understood in the course of these orders. He didn't do that. Instead, he chose to continue fighting. I would point this court to the uh, difference between what appears in the opening brief and the reply brief versus what appeared in the docketing statement. These arguments and, and what appeared in the trial court below. Jurisdiction was never argued. Uh, a lack of change of circumstance with respect to the final order was never argued. Here we are with, with arguments that are made up in the rearview mirror out of what appears to be, frankly, desperation, a desire to keep on fighting, which this court sees all the time, and which family courts see uh, <laughs> even more frequently, dare I say. A re there is a remedy for a litigant who is brought into such circumstances, someone who does not have financial resources, and that would be my client in this case. That one is why the, we would request a fee. One of the findings of the best interest was that mother was now able to stay at home with the children because she's now married to someone who is Correct. Uh, providing support. Correct. So it, it seems odd to na now say that I mean, that, that was something that worked in her favor, and now that's uh, that counts against husband. When we're, we're dealing with different statutes here, but but in terms of the financial resources, we look at the income of father; it's significant. We look at the income of mother; it's relatively insignificant. That's my point. Um, I am just about out of time. Does the court have any other questions for me? No. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your time. Stan Murray again for the re appellant. I want to address this Tucson issue. Uh, first of all, it wasn't alleged in the petition because when mother filed the petition in April of 2014, father hadn't relocated to Tucson yet. Uh, that was raised in the motion, her response to the motion to dismiss. And the testimony was that the location to Tucson by my client was only temporary because he didn't know where the children were coming back to. Um, <laughs> the court in uh, Index of Record 108, which is the minute entry ruling of November 12, 2014, Judge Edelman even noted, father is employed at the Pinal Air Park and currently lives in a two-bedroom apartment. These are temporary accommodations given his uncertainty regarding these proceedings. And then he goes on to that footnote, which Mr. Shields cites heavily, saying it's unfortunate that he moved to Tucson. Well, Judge Edelman seems to be contradicting himself because he knows it's a temporary arrangement and that father is simply waiting for the kids to relocate to Arizona. Whether it's in Goodyear, Surprise, or Tucson has to be decided yet because mother is not coming back to Arizona, apparently. And then the issue about whether these kids can handle moving around, um, the parties lived in Surprise, Arizona in 2007. That was a testimony from mother, and two of the kids were living with them at that time. Then they moved to Virginia when father was reassigned. Then mother moved them back to Arizona. Then mother moved them to California. The kids don't have any permanent attachment that's going to detrimentally affect them if they have to go back to Arizona, which they did attend schools here, even though it was sort of a short six-month period. These kids are used to moving around, so that's not an important issue either. All of the cases consistently repeat, you have to show a change of circumstances before we get to the best interest analysis. We cited Pridgen, we cited Black, we cited even Dorman, and there's also the Christopher K case. The cases are adamant that you must prove a change of circumstances in your petition 
before we get to the merits of the best interest of the kids. Um, how, about, how about fees? On the issue of attorney's fees, you found, or you saw the findings that Judge Edelman made regarding why he was awarding attorney's fees. We know from the Myrick versus Mahoney case that it's not just about financial disparity, it's also about reasonableness. The reasons that Judge Edelman awarded attorney's fees was because he found mother's conduct unreasonable. But yet, <laughs> father spends over $16,000 in attorney's fees and only gets $3,500 awarded. We appreciate the award, but there's got to be a lesson sent here. There's got to be a message sent for mother's conduct. She violated preliminary injunction. She violated the agreement. She violated the order of July 1st, 2014 to return the kids. Father is not only that, he had to incur attorney's fees in California also to fight off the jurisdictional request that she was trying to make for California to take jurisdiction. Father was not fairly compensated, and I know it's a discretionary ruling for the trial court, but I don't think the evidence supports a rule, um, an order as small as $3,500 when such substantial fees were spent. So we're asking the court to reconsider How about that. fees on appeal? What would you argue? Well, we're again asking for attorney's fees on appeal because of the positions taken by mother in this uh, appeal, um, arguing that Dorman is <laughs> the conclusory case in this issue is not quite correct. As Judge Johnson points out, the one-year limitation wasn't discussed in Dorman. It may not have even existed. So this is a case of first impression. I feel we were justified in raising that issue. But again, for mother to argue that father is staying in Tucson and that's a change of circumstances when that wasn't even alleged is not an appropriate or reasonable position to take in this appeal. So. We're asking the court for attorney's fees on appeal as well as reversal of the attorney's fees in the trial court. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. And thank you to both sets of, of attorneys for your, for your arguments and for your briefs. Uh, before, we, before we adjourn, I have a note for our bailiff that I'd like you to take a look at that before we go. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, We'll take this matter under advisement and we'll issue a ruling in due course and we stand adjourned.